He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask to you, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way for you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, that the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right, because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves, because they had not been baptized by John. To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to each other. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. But John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Grant. I'm one of the preachers here at St John's who fills in for uh, Jim every now and again. And uh, I'm breaking with tradition because I'm going to stand rather than sit. I'm just, uh, you know, that kind of guy, a standing guy. Anyway, it's good to be with you, and, but won't it be great when we can uh, get back together here in this space? That I'm looking forward to that. Well, we're looking this morning at John uh, chapter 7 uh, and, uh, and expectations and dealing with doubt, really. Um, life can be difficult when you expect one thing and you end up with another. Uh, and often that's a trivial thing. You expect a sunny day and it's raining. Uh, but it can be more serious. You might expect that your marriage is going to go well and it doesn't go so well. Or you expect to be healthy and you end up with a chronic sickness. And it can happen in our Christian lives as well. Uh, we give our lives to the Lord. We expect that things are going to go well. We're going to kind of have one victory of, of, over sin after another. But uh, it doesn't go that well. Um, things don't work out well. We end up uh, struggling with sin, we end up being unhappy, unwell, and uh, we feel devastated. Uh, we don't feel happy with our Christian lives at all. I had a lady come to see me a little while back who had converted from Hinduism to Christianity. And one of the reasons she did that was so that she could uh, hopefully overcome her depression. But that didn't work out so well for her. And uh, so she came to see me and she was filled with confusion and with doubt and with a million questions. And perhaps as I describe that lady, I'm not just describing uh, her, but maybe I'm describing you as well. Uh, I know I'm describing me. 
not all the time, but certainly sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, I don't cope that well with the Christian life. I have doubts and I have questions. And the, the big thing, I guess, a big challenge for us is, well, what do we do with that? What, how, do we, how do we deal with that? And this morning's passage or today's passage helps us to answer that question. As I said, Luke chapter 7, and we're going to look from verse 18 through to the end of the chapter, verse 35. And Luke is relating in this passage a time when John the Baptist was dealing with confusion and with doubt. And we come across John the Baptist uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where we saw that he was the forerunner of the Christ who was to come. And uh, John called upon people to repent of their sins in order to be ready for the Messiah. And he was fearless in doing that. He was a fearless preacher. Uh, He even confronted Herod, who was the king, about his marriage. Uh, So fearless was he. And for his trouble, he was thrown into prison. And uh, that happened not long after the ministry of Jesus began. And so he only knows about Jesus' ministry from the reports that he hears. And what he hears fills him with doubt. And you can see the nature of those doubts if you've got your Bible there open uh, in front of you uh, in verse 18 of of Luke chapter 7. Uh, Verse 18 says this, John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you who was the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, John's questions and doubts are understandable because he was expecting Jesus' ministry to be very different than what it was. If you look back to Luke chapter 3 and verses 7 to 9, you get the feeling of what he was expecting the Messiah would do and would be. Uh, In verse 7 of Luke chapter 3, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and don't begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John is expecting Jesus to come and to have a ministry of cleansing and of judgment. He's calling people to leave their sins behind or else run the risk of being thrown into the fire of judgment. And if you look a little further on in verse 17 of of Luke 3, he talks about the Messiah coming with a baptism of the spirit and of fire. In John's mind, the Christ, the Messiah, would come and he would pour out the Spirit on believers, as the Old Testament said he would, but he would also pour out the fire of judgment on unbelievers who didn't repent of their sin and who didn't believe. But that's not what John is seeing. He was imprisoned by a king that he expected the Messiah would destroy. And he's hearing reports of Jesus going around associating and eating with people he expected the Messiah would judge. And so as far as he can tell, Jesus is much less powerful than he expected the Messiah would be. And he's far softer on sin than he expected the Messiah would be. And so understandably, he's confused. He's full of doubts and questions. And friends, it seems to me that that's what we need to do with our doubts. We need to turn them into questions and seek answers for those questions. Now, I think a lot of people are scared of doubt. Uh, they're scared that if they express it, it will somehow take over their faith and destroy it. A bit like Voldemort in the Harry Potter novels. You know, he's the dark wizard who's everybody's scared of. And so no one speaks his name because, you know, if we speak his name, then he's going to become more real. And that's what we think about doubt. But the opposite is the case. See, doubt unexpressed leads to unbelief. But doubt expressed leads to greater belief. Henry Drummond, in an article in Christianity Today, expressed it like this. He said, We are born questioners. Look at the wonderment of a little child in its eyes before it can speak. 
The child's great word when it begins to speak is why. Every child is full of every kind of question about every kind of thing that moves and shines and changes in the little world in which it lives. That is the incipient doubt in the nature of man. Respect doubt for its origin. It is an inevitable thing. It's not a thing to be crushed. It is a part of man as God made him. Doubt is the prelude of knowledge. Friends, let me encourage you, don't be scared by doubt. Don't be scared of questions because it is as we express our doubt and turn those doubt into questions and seek answers for those questions that doubt subsides and faith begins to rise. But if you leave doubts unexpressed, they will kill your faith eventually. John the Baptist expresses his doubts. He sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Well, how does Jesus respond? First thing I want you to note about Jesus' response is that he doesn't get angry with John for expressing his doubts. You know, he doesn't send the messages back and, you know, say, you know, tell John he's a terrible sinner for being so full of doubts. I expected a lot better of him and he's really letting the side down big time. He doesn't say that. Instead, he is very gracious and very patient with John's concerns. So if you look in verse 21, it's a fascinating verse, I think. It says, at that very time, that's really important. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. Do you see what he's doing? He's accommodating John's doubts. John is in prison. He can't see what Jesus is doing. But while his messengers are there, in their presence, he cures many people with diseases and sicknesses. He casts out evil spirits. He gives sight to the blind so that these messengers can go back to John and say, hey, listen, we saw him do it. We saw him do these miracles. He's the real deal. But that's not all he does. He also says to the messengers in verse 22, Go back, report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now, why does he say that? Well, if you've been listening carefully, then you'll you'll probably recognise that back in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus began his ministry, When he was handed the scroll and found the place uh, where he read from, that it was these very words that he read. Uh, He read them and then he sat down and then he said to the crowd assembled, today in, in your presence these words are fulfilled. Now that reading was Isaiah 61, part of the Old Testament that spoke about what would happen when the Messiah came. And Jesus is saying to John's disciples, go back and tell John that I am doing what the prophet said the Messiah would do when he came. Go back and tell him that. Jesus goes out of his way to dispel John's doubts. Now, there's another interesting thing I want to to point out to you that we need to know. If you look in your Bibles to Isaiah 61 and the passage that Jesus read when he started his ministry and that he quotes to John's messengers here. It says this, verse 1 of chapter 61, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's the passage Jesus read when his ministry begins. But look at what it goes on to say in the next line. Verse 2 says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it? See, what is it that John is expecting of the Messiah? A baptism of fire, the day of vengeance of our God. 
But Jesus doesn't go on and quote that part of the verse, not at the beginning of his ministry and not when he sends the messengers back to John. Now, that's curious, isn't it? Why is that? Well, it's not because he's not going to bring judgment. It's not because he's soft on sin, as John perhaps thought he might be, but simply because it's not yet time for judgment. So John's expectations and doubts are partly due to the fact that his timing is out. He's expecting the Messiah when he came would bring a baptism of fire. But the primary purpose of Jesus' first coming is to baptise with the Spirit, to bring salvation and grace and the mercy that we saw last week in, in, our, in our passage in the Sermon on the Mount. And the primary pur- purpose of his second coming will be to baptise with fire, to bring judgment. That time, however, is future to John and to Jesus and, and his ministry here at this time. It remains future to us as well. And so a big part of John's problem that leads to his doubts was that his timing is out. And that's often a big problem with our doubt as well, isn't it? We want God to judge sin, particularly other people's sin. But when it, 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 it's, really, it's really it's time to forgive sin now. We want him to heal us, to make us wealthy, to put a, 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 a constant smile on our faces, to, to give us heaven on earth, when really we have to wait for heaven. Often our expectations are wrong and our timing is wrong. And when things don't work out the way we planned or the Christian life doesn't deliver what we expect, uh, then we end up with doubts and fears and questions. And we've seen on the positive side that Jesus accommodates those doubts. He invites questioning. He responds graciously to those doubts. But he also says very clearly he will not fit in with our agenda or with our time frame. He's not going to come along and tick all the boxes that we have in our minds and make him the sort of God that we want him to be. He won't do that. He won't come along and fulfill all of our expectations. Now, that doesn't mean that God is not God. That's the conclusion we often draw, isn't it? If God doesn't do what I expect he will do, then it means that he's not God. Of course, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that we're not God. That's what it means. We need to march to the beat of his drum, not the other way round. And that's the way the passage ends. It ends by asking, who is calling the tune? So if you look in verse 29 of of Luke chapter 7, it says this, All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard John's words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptised by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptised by John. See, it's interesting as you read these verses that John had some things in common with the Pharisees and religious leaders and he had some things that weren't in common with them. Like the Pharisees, John expected the Messiah to act differently than he did. But unlike them, he sent messengers to ask the question, are you the one? He was open-minded. He turned his doubts into questions and those questions, when answered, led to faith. But look what the Pharisees did in verse 30. It simply says they rejected God's purpose for themselves. Their response is, if God doesn't do what he want him to do, want, want him to do, what we want him to do rather, then he can't be God. Certainly, we don't want him as our God. Their attitude is one of closed-minded, hard-hearted arrogance. And Jesus attacks that attitude in verses 31 and 35. He says, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came eating bread, uh, neither, uh, sorry, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. 
The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. So the religious leaders wanted God's word and God's messengers, but only on their terms. They wanted to be the ones who called the tune. But Jesus is saying here, that's not the way it works, friends. God is the one who calls the tune, not us. Our expectations need to fall in line behind his, not the other way round. Now, of course, that's not easy, is it? It's easy to trust God and to be full of confidence when he's playing a major key in our lives and when all is well. But when he's playing a minor key and things are sad and the road is rocky, then it's much more difficult. It's at those times especially that we need to struggle with our doubts and fears and seek God in prayer. And if we do, he'll help us to overcome those doubts. As we've seen, God is merciful to the questioner. He accommodates our doubts and our fears and our questioning so that faith can be strengthened. That doesn't mean he'll necessarily change our circumstances and make everything the way we hope, but he will enable us to better understand his purpose, to trust more fully his power, and to give ourselves more entirely to his care. And really those things are more important, aren't they, than, uh, than us calling the tune. We need to let God do that uh, because he's the one who is God and he does it best. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that when we doubt, you are there to answer our questions and to calm our fears, that you are a merciful and gracious God to the person who has questions, that you don't judge us for those things. And so we pray that we would be like, the, like John the Baptist, that we, as we see here in this passage, that our questions wouldn't lead us into unbelief, but rather they would lead us to greater faith in you, our loving and gracious Heavenly Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, everybody. My name is Pamela, and I'm going to lead us all in prayer. Heavenly Father, Creator God, we come before you this day with hope and gratitude. We have hope because we know that whatever is happening in this COVID-19 world, we have a Heavenly Saviour who cares for us and everything large and small that happens is part of His plan. We cannot see the future, but he, our Lord, can, and we can trust him. We have gratitude in our hearts that we live in Australia and our leaders took decisive steps to protect us and we are doing the best of almost every country. So we thank you, Lord. We also thank you for our church and its leaders who have cared for our spiritual needs, putting our service online so we have food for our minds and our hearts. Help us to stay focused on the positives and not become despondent as we hear bad news so we can cope with all the changes this pandemic is bringing Help us to keep our hygiene standards high so that we don't bring about a second wave as people can become complacent. We thank you for the enthusiasm for Kids Club, even though it will be daunting and difficult. We ask you especially to care for the vulnerable in our community, the old, the sick, the frail, and all the health workers. We are learning all the time more about you, even those of us who have been Christians a very long time. There's always something more in the scriptures. A parable we have known about for a long time can still teach us more about you, 
and about how we should live. We thank you for our friends and family and the small but very welcome easing of the restrictions on our lives. We who have enough to eat and good shelter pray for those who have not and are not so blessed. We pray for our link missionaries working under difficult circumstances and far from their families. We thank you for sunshine and rain, for green grass and blue skies, for lovely sunsets and sunrises, all the beauty of your creation, and for the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us remember your unfailing love. Thank you, Lord. We pray knowing that you hear us and love us as we pray in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen.
Father, take us and use us to love and serve you this week in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would help us to honour you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and love the Lord your God and serve him with all your hearts this week.